We can also use tables, frequency tables, to um, describe quantitative data. Um, the difference, though, with quantitative data is we're talking about numerical data. And when we think about numbers uh, or data collected numbers, we uh, would have lots of different numbers potentially, and we wouldn't want a category for each individual number. For instance, if you're dealing with math test scores, you wouldn't want a category for just everybody who got a 78, because maybe only one person got a 78. In fact, maybe in 20 test scores, everyone got a different percentage score. Um, you want a different way of organizing them so you don't have 20 categories. What you generally want to do is organize the numbers into bins or ranges before you put it into a table. Now, those bins or um, for a math test might be the score range. Uh, and you want to make sure that the bins you create are consistent in size. Um, for instance, if you decide to have a score range of 90 to 99, 99, you would want to make all of your other score ranges be those 10 same, same width of 10 units. So 80 to 89, 70 to 79. The other thing you want to do is um, make sure you include all of the data values in your bins from lowest to highest. And so you'd want to make sure that you have a bin that covers from the highest all the way down to the lowest with this consistency of size. So my highest value in this data set of test scores, if I scan through, looks like an, a 98. So that's why it's important that I started my, uh, my first range in the 90s, my score range. And then the lowest score appears to be about a 42. So notice my table goes to a uh, bin of 40 to 49 to make sure I get the lowest value in before I stop the table. You wouldn't have to uh, put anything below that in, any values in the table before that, because you don't have any data beyond that bin. Uh, now, the way people create bins generally depends on what their data looks like. So I've created these bins based on what would typically be an A on a math test. For instance, 90 to 99. Uh, B would typically be 80 to 89. A C would be typically 70 to 79. But once you start that pattern of what, how big the bin is, the, we want to make sure we're consistent in size. So um, notice, as we continue on, you the next uh, bin would be the Ds, but then you would have several bins going down that represent Fs, because um, you're thinking about those bins as being the same size, and you need to keep with that same size once you define it at the beginning. Now, for each of these bins, we're going to count up how many grades were within them. So we're going to create the frequency, and this is what makes this a frequency table. Um, so again, it's better, instead of saying frequency, maybe to say what this represents, it would be number of grades. So I'm just going to make the, the title a little more specific. All right, so what we want to do is go back to our table and count up how many A's, uh, specifically values between 90 and 99 there were, and then do the same thing for um, uh, 80 to 89, 70 to 79, etc. So if you want to pause and do that real quick, you're welcome to. Um, likewise, the two other t um, columns in this um, uh, table are very consistent with what we talked about with frequency tables in the other example. So it might be good to pause just to practice finding the relative frequency and the cumulative frequency for each of these categories. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause myself here to give you a chance to pause, try to fill in these this table, and then I'll, I'll show the answers. All right, so I highlighted some of the categories here. Um, so I highlighted the A's, the, the scores that were between 90 and, and 99 in yellow, and there were five of those grades. Um, grades that were between 80 and 89, there were three. I highlighted those in green. 70 to 79, there were six. 60 to 69, there were two. There were no uh, grades between 50 and 59, and that is um, something we should show because we have to be consistent with our ranges until we get to the last, um, uh, the lowest value. And so you do have to show that you might have none in a particular uh, score range. And then 40 to 49, we have uh, the ones that I didn't highlight four grades at that range. Um, one thing to do is to total this up and make sure you have what you 
thought you should. Uh, 5 plus 3 plus 6 plus 2 plus 4 is 20 grades. And if we had counted these up, there were 20 test score grades, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Relative frequency, we simply take the number that we're in that um, bin and divide by the total. So 5 divided by 20, and I'm just going to write all of these out as percents. So that would be 25%. For the next uh, range from 80 to 89, we have 15% of our grades. The next one would be 30%. The next one would be 10%. Zero would be 0%. And finally, 20%. And again, I get those relative frequencies by simply taking the uh, number that was in that category and dividing by the total. So 4 or divided by 20 gives me 20%. Adding those up, we should get 100% if we've done things correctly. And indeed, this does come out to be 100%. Cumulative frequency is a running total. So at the beginning, we only have one value, five test scores. Uh, but then in the next, uh, row, the next row down, we have three more. So five plus three is eight. In the next one down, we have six. So eight plus six is 14. The next one down, we have two more. So that would be 16. Next one down is zero. So that would be still 16. And then the last one is four, gives us 20. Again, you never total up the cumulative frequency uh, column because the last value at your last bin would be the um, all of the test scores. That would give us a total. So that's why you never total them up. So that's a nice little review, but what's different about this example is because we were dealing with numerical data, we had to create bins. Now, describing quantitative data with graphs, usually what someone's going to do is create what we call a histogram. Um, it is possible they might do a pie chart, but a histogram is generally what you'll see. Um, so a histogram is, if you look at this, it looks like a bar graph. And in fact, it's a bar graph uh, for numerical data. We call it a histogram because it is a little bit different. It's a little different than a bar graph, um, a typical bar graph for quantitative data. Um, the reason it's a little bit different is because, first of all, because we're dealing with numerical data, your horizontal axis is going to be a number line because it's representing the numbers involved with that data set. And the bars are going to show you um, where your bins are. So each bar, if we look at the number line, this first bar goes from 40 to 50. So we have a bin from 40 to 50. And one of the things to note is that on the graph, you can't really tell if that's 40 to 49 or it may be 41 to 50. Um, it's hard to say whether they're including, which endpoint they're including, but they're generally including one or the other because it has to be consistent as you continue all over. Our next bin, uh, inter bar is going to be either again 60 to 69 or um, it could be 61 to 70. We know from because we organize this data ourselves that the bin are actually the low number 40 to 49 then 60 to 69 um, but when you look at it cold without having seen the original data you might not know how that stacks up but you do know that basically you have um, the height of this bar just like with any bar graph, is telling you how many data points you have in this range between 40 and 50. In this case, the, this bar goes up as high as 4, and we see that height on the vertical axis just like we would with a regular bar graph. And so that means there are four grades between uh, 40 and 49. Uh, the next bar over um, is at a height of 2, so that means there were two grades that, had, that were between 60 and 70, basically. So the um, number line is one big difference with the histogram. And also because it's a number line and data may be right next to each other on a number line, you may have a test score of 60 and 61 or 69 and 70, the bars will not be separated. So the bars will be right next to each other instead of separated. So the bars will be touching. Once again, anytime you're reading a graph, it's important to always look for the title of the graph as well as the labels for each axis so that you understand what that graph is telling you.